All right, so this morning we're going to continue on our Easter eggs. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about praying for people um, in our spaces, see what God would do. And I, I reminded you all to pray for me this week, and your prayers were answered. I had three situations this week with people that truly annoyed me. Um, one of them was very public. I posted on Facebook that someone stole a bicycle cart out of the back parking lot of the shop. This gentleman was driving a very nice vehicle. He was not someone in need, and it drove me crazy. I had to call the police. It was this big to-do. The gentleman reached out to me on Tuesday because his neighbor told him that he stole from Bike and Soul and he might want to contact me. Um, then to find out it's this whole big story behind it, and it was a big misunderstanding because he thought he could take it because I had given him something before, and he just thought he could just take things. It was a freebie pile. And I said, no, sir, I was just a generous guy. Later on that week, someone else decided to steal something from the back of the shop. And it was on camera, so this time it was just a wheel, and I didn't really feel like getting into it with the cops and so forth over a used wheel. But I did invite the police out to talk to me about what am I doing wrong? Am I inviting theft on the property? I said, I have signs that says, smile, you're on the camera. I have private property signs. I have motion lights. We've got regular lights. And the police officer said, no, Scott. You're just a generous guy. You're probably one of the most generous people I know in town. And in fact, generous people usually get taken advantage of. I don't want to be generous. <laughs> that was the answer, right? So there it went. And then later on in the week, someone that we were renting an electric bike to that was in need said that they would pay us $20 every two weeks. And she hasn't paid it all in months. So I had to ask for the bike back. Now we're still going to help her out. But I found it interesting that when I ask you all to pray for me over situations that are annoying, I had three very big ones this week that put me out of my comfort zone a little. And it's fascinating to me so often how when we do, and just like the scriptures that we read this morning, we seek God, we will find him. And as we move in life, I think it it's fascinates me all the time that when I think that I want God to move in my life, that it's always going to be roses and sunshine and rainbows and unicorns and, and candies that fall from the trees that don't add weight to me, right? Like, we think that. But the fact is, is that our fight is not against flesh and blood. And I think it's important for us to be reminded as we come into Holy Week this week that as we pray for God to move in our life, it may not be some simple things. So as we continue on this week in the Easter egg series, we're going to be looking at a couple scriptures. Primarily, we're going to dig into Psalm 22. We're going to look at Psalm 22 because there's some spots in Psalm 22 that are reflected in Jesus' death on the cross. And we see in Matthew 27, 25, 39, 43, and then we're going to hop over into John 23, 24, and 28 there. And we're going to look at what's happening with Jesus uh, compared to Psalm 22. So your big idea this week is that King David penned Psalm 22 as the cry of a righteous sufferer. And it so aptly fits the circumstances of Jesus' crucifixion that even he took it to his lips on the cross. Even when we feel like all is against us, we can find comfort in God who knows what it's like to suffer. And it fascinates me as we continue to look in this series between the Old Testament and the New Testament and how Jesus fulfills these prophecies even in the time of the cross. So your application point this week is the is to reflect and realize that we may not understand the purpose of our own trials at the time they occur, but we can know that God is at work on a bigger scale. So even this past week with the annoyances of people taking things off the property, I was glad that it wasn't anything too malicious. I was glad things that were taken were not all that expensive. But through the trials and the activities that were going on, there was definitely God moved and conversations were had. Oh, and I forgot to mention the guy with the wheel. It was his wheel that someone had stolen from him, and we ended up forging a very nice conversation. And see, it's fascinating to me, and I don't know how you all get about this, but I don't, like, so often I feel like humans want to figure God out, right? I mean, does that make sense when I say it? Like, I think we want, at the end of the day, to understand God fully. But then if we did, then he wouldn't be the mystery and it would lose the luster of him being God because he would be just like us. 
So when we go through trials, and as we look at this this morning, and we see what God is doing, and we have a time of reflection, I want us to realize that the rough stuff that happens in life, God always gets to use it for his glory. And many times over, we don't get to see it right away, but many times we do. So let's dig in to Psalm 22 right now. And let me read this chapter for you. And I'll stop at a couple spots along the way to point some things out. By the way, I want to mention, this is the one thing that I love about preaching, is I get to be a tour guide for God. I love being able to spot out when God is moving. I love that in my life, and I'm very thankful for that. And that is something that I hope you get to have those opportunities more in your life where you get to be the tour guide for God. So in Psalm 22, it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from, me, far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and our fathers trusted. In you, our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. This is the beauty of the Old Testament. Like, The scripture was written, and as David pens this psalm, we see that there is this looking back, realizing what has happened in the past, and the faithfulness of God with the forefathers is something that we can hold on to, that he can hold on to, and we get to hold on to. So not only your personal family history with God, but then we also have the history that comes with the scriptures. But I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let them deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Now, we're going to jump in later, but I just want to highlight these spots here. We're going to see this later with Jesus and how it correlates, the foreshadowing that's going on. Yet, You are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. Wow. Like, how often do we reflect on our birthing process, right? Like, I don't wake up every day and go, wow, I wonder what it was like when I was born. But when you stop and just take a moment to reflect on the beauty and the miracle of birth and how we are birthed into this world from our mother's womb and our mother has everything capable to care for us. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of my joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted Within my breast, my strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have, check this out, have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is not just some type of punishment that's happening that is being described or persecution that you're reading here. This is an execution. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. 
My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. See, there is this praising that's happening of the God that he knows. The Lord that he knows can still be praised in the midst of the affliction. And on top of that, we also note here, and and we're going to see this at the end too, there isn't, a lot of times David would write in the Psalms pretty much all the time about this equaling at the end, crying out for justice. And watch how it ends here. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families and nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Even the one who cannot keep himself alive, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord of the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. This whole piece here, this whole writing, this whole psalm that David has written is about someone else. There is nothing at all in any piece of history that David has ever said he went through this stuff. This is all being written about Jesus. A foreshadowing. And then we also see in this that there is a trust level that goes along with this whole process. Now, let's hop to Matthew now. Let's look at Matthew 27, verse 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And notice right there in the beginning of 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus on the cross. is giving this. In the process of Jesus going through everything that's happening, he is able to still give the signs and wonders of God that were given to David. 2739, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their hands. I mean, shaking their heads. And again, in Psalm 22, we see that. 27.43, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. They're mocking him and asking him to show his power. And in 22, we see David clearly talk about that. This correlation, this foreshadowing to me, shows how big God is. The mystery of God and how he is able to work. 1923, the 24 in John. It says, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one of each of them with the undergarment remaining. The garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. This is the mystery of God that keeps me waking up in the morning. That God is able, through David and writings, able to call out what Roman soldiers will do centuries later. It makes me wonder a little. Like, And again, I'm just, this is me being creative in my imagination, okay? I'm just letting you know that. This is just me pondering and wondering. But I wonder if there was ever a family member in my blood lineage that woke up one day and thought his world or her world was a mess and didn't want to be on the planet anymore. And God spoke to them and said, keep going because generations to come will be affected by you living. Right? Does it make sense when I say that, right? Like, like, how often do we step up to the plate in life when we don't want to because we're encouraged by God? We don't know all the time what might happen later. David writes this psalm, and down through history, his words are being reflected not only because it's Scripture 
and that David wrote it, but also because the Roman soldiers did it. Mind-blowing to me. John 19, 28. Later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. So Jesus was of sound mind enough to know that he needed to finish, that in the midst of his torture, in the midst of his dying, he is still chasing after the Father's will. See, if you look at Psalm 22 by itself, it creates this puzzling thing because when you read it all, it never fits. And I mentioned this before, but I want to say it again. Like Psalm 22 doesn't fit in the rest of David's Psalms. It just, it's, it's laid out very differently. But when you look at it in light of what Jesus went through, it all makes sense. It's beautiful. The foreshadowing is phenomenal. And that type of foreshadowing can happen if there's one author. Like how many times you watch a movie? Ro and I were watching a movie last night. You could see the foreshadowing later on. Oh, that what happened there. Oh, there it is now. Like foreshadowing happens in good books and good stories. And God, the author of our lives, is able to do that here. The process of the cross and how it happens and what they did is detailed out right there in Psalm 22. The piercing of the hands. See, the cross bears something to us. As Jesus came in to Jerusalem, there was this expectation that he was going to be Lord in a different way. Riding in on donkey was not what they expected. And this whole process with Jesus fits when you look at Scripture all through the Old Testament of the Messiah. It's just how they viewed it all. They twisted it and made it into their mindset and not God's mindset. And how often do we do that, right? We go through things and we go through pains. So this is my plug for Thursday night before we move into a time of reflection. Thursday night, we're going to take communion. I highly recommend you show up. We're going to take communion. We're going to have a moment. We're going to be reflecting on scriptures and talking about some of the things that Jesus was trying to get across and combat in his last words in the upper room. And I invite you to come out for communion because communion can be something that, yes, as we break bread and we recognize as we eat meals with our friends that Jesus is the center of our lives and that can be communion. But when we have a ritual together in our faith community, it also is a powerful time. And I invite you out for that. Jesus went through so much. In Deuteronomy 21, 23, in Galatians 3, 13, it talks about anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. And at this time, what I would love for us to do is pause for about five minutes. We're going to have a song that's going to be played up here. And I want you to reflect on this reality of what Jesus did that he died and rose again, that he gives you a different meaning of life than just to be born and die and do something in between. But that when you wake up in the morning, he's the reason. That God is alive and moving in us and with us and through us and around us. So Troy, if you could play that film for us, please.
dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul. To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking. Stayed aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb who is the great I Am. And while millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing. I think it's good for us to take moments and reflect. I think it's also good for us to realize that David and Jesus, they paralleled each other in so many ways. And David was able to move and to walk and to go through suffering and go through pain. And there was a lot of foreshadowing that happened with David that we see played out in Jesus' life. David was part of Jesus' lineage on earth. That's something that really has stuck with me this week, and I want you to also hold on to this too if you can. 
realize that you're part of physical family as well as spiritual family. And what you do matters. Like, we have the ability to pass down things to others. We have the ability to set things up for generations to come. I want you to own that this week a little bit. Own that in your prayers. Own that as you step out into the world around you. See, I think it's easy for us to ignore the future because we get so wrapped up in the present. Amen? Does that make sense? Like, like we've got stuff in our everyday lives that can distract us, but there is this bigger thing going on with God with us. And our days matter. We wake up in the morning because he calls us to it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm grateful that Jesus cried out those words because it means that I, never, I need never fear to cry them out myself. I need never fear nor feel any sense of guilt during the inevitable moments of forsakenness. They come to us all. They are part of soul's growth. Madeline Lengel. You're allowed to go through bad days. You're allowed to mourn and have pain. You are allowed to suffer and let God know about it because he is with you. And the fact that Jesus was able to cry these out, those words out and to let that out shows us that there is a direct line that we have to God on a regular basis. Church, Jesus was able to say this so that we don't have to. See, Jesus was able to go to the cross and to do this ultimate sacrifice to reset the board, to change where our souls go because we don't have to. We get to live in this graceful setting because of what happened on the cross. I know you're probably shocked I'm putting this slide up. But I cannot reiterate enough. I had conversations about this with multiple people this week about claiming Jesus is your Lord. And I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. I believe the biggest thing that stops us from getting closer to God is ourselves. Amen. Whatever our circumstances are, there's always someone worse and someone better. I guarantee you. But the beautiful thing is, is that when we step out on a daily basis and we claim Jesus as Lord, we know that no matter what we're going through, there will be something greater on the other end. And that's our hope. Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, you're an amazing God. You're a mystery. You're a wonder, but yet you're so logical and you make sense. God, I thank you for being consistent. I thank you for constantly being there in the times of despair and in the times of joy. Lord, I am so thankful for putting people in our lives that raise us up and keep us moving. So God, I ask that you help us this week to be people that are just simply amazing, that we can look at our day and know that you were there, that we can wake up in the morning and be anxious to see you and look forward to going to sleep at night so we can find that rest. God, we want to see you more in our days. So help us to open our eyes and look in the right directions. Lord, give us prompts throughout the week that let us know you are there. Whether it's a dime or a hello or someone giving us an encouraging word or someone in need that we can fill that need in that moment. But Lord, you're amazing. And we own that you made us amazing. So Lord, help us to be amazing this week. And we give this to you in your awesome holy name. Amen. Amen.